Well, hello. Uh, my name is Neil Levesque, and I'm the executive director here at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College. This is New Hampshire's home for politics. Uh, in this very room, we have quite um, an array of activities. This morning, we had uh, David Axelrod, who is President Obama's campaign manager, legendary campaign manager. Uh, we have this fine panel tonight. Tomorrow in this room, Governor Romney will be doing a town hall meeting. Uh, Thursday morning, Dr. Ron uh, Paul will be doing politics and eggs. We have uh, the Secretary of State here on Friday afternoon. And at Friday at 2.30, the best part of my job, which is we're going to be doing a naturalization ceremony and welcoming 70 new Americans. Um, so that's at 2.30. Um, we are New Hampshire's home for politics, as I mentioned. We try to uh, encapsulate and bring as much civic activity as possible here. Um, the only way that we can do that is with our partners. And one great partner that we have here at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics is AT&T. AT&T has been um, helping us with many of the great programs that you see here. Or if you turn on C-SPAN, if you turn on Manchester Public Television, Channel 9, all of that programming, a lot of that has to do with AT&T. So we thank them, and I want to introduce David Mancusco from AT&T for a short welcome. Good evening. I want to thank Neil and folks here at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics in St. Anselm. Um, the work that, that both those groups are doing uh, is making a major change in the political discourse that's occurring in our country, and the work they're doing to educate the next generation of civic leaders for our nation is, is extremely impressive. So we're very proud to be part of this event this evening. Um, I'm very happy to say that um, as part of the social media and contemporary campaign program tonight, um, we're the first to recognize the guys who run the network this traffic goes over just what social media is doing today to the political campaign and to the political process. It truly is revolutionizing things. So I think you're in for a very exciting conversation tonight. I can assure you for our part, we will continue to invest in the network that is running uh, underneath all of these applications and all of these services, whether it's Facebook or Twitter, whatever it may be. Um, we've put about $60 million in the network here in New Hampshire itself and about $20 billion nationwide. So the work that is going to be happening here uh, at the college, the work that is going to be happening at the Institute, and the work that you all will be doing in the world of politics and new media um, will have a good, strong, robust, fast network on, on which to operate. So I, I hope you all will test that network and push it to its limits and um, really challenge yourselves to change the way political discourse happens in our country. With that, I'd like to introduce Kevin Ward, who will introduce your panelists. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kevin Ward. I'm a senior communication major here at St. Anselm College, and I'm a student ambassador at the Institute of Politics. I have the distinct honor to welcome the panelists and the moderator here tonight at tonight's event for social media on uh, campaigns. Um, first, Ryan Davis is the social media director at Blue State Digital, where, um, where he also was the member of Howard Dean's groundbreaking 2004 <coughs> presidential campaign on the web team for that. <laughs> Make sure they get their round of applause. And next is Clay Chasso, is a founder and partner of the New Media Campaigns, and in 2010, Business Week named Chasso one of the top uh, 25, um, 25 entrepreneurs under 25 in America. And Julie Lynn Gibbons of I3 Strategies currently serves as the new media director for We Are People Michigan and has worked with a variety of LGBT and labor organizations on various campaigns and initiatives. And tonight, our moderator, Mr. Patrick Griffin, is a founding partner, chairman, and CEO of Griffin, York & Krauss, the largest advertising, strat strategic communications, and integrated marketing firm in northern New England. And he also is a senior fellow here at the Institute of Politics. Well, good evening, and welcome to what I'm now tweeting as the epicenter of New Hampshire politics between now and maybe halftime on Thanksgiving Day. We don't know yet when, 
Uh, the primary seems to be moving forward a little bit. I'll take wagers tonight that it's probably before Valentine's Day. But I know Secretary say Bill Gardner is prepared to hold it during halftime of the Thanksgiving Day ball games if he needs to. Um, you're in for a real treat tonight, and I want to do a couple of, of housekeeping things before we start. First of all, tonight uh, we are live streaming. Our friends at Delivery, uh, Delivery or Die Alliance are uh, videotaping and live streaming tonight. I know when you usually go to one of these things, the first thing people say is, would you please turn off your cell phones? We would only ask that you silence your cell phones if you have a mobile Twitter machine with you, as I like to call it. You may feel free to join that way, but if you're in the crowd, we'd much rather hear from you. So when I call on you, tell us who you are. I know we've got students from St. Anselm here tonight, faculty, people in the community. St. Paul's, how many, how many Paulies we got here? A few, great, welcome. Um, the second thing is that we will also be taking uh, comments from and questions from the people who are following our live stream at uh, NHIOPSM, hashtag NHIOPSM. So if you want to follow both ways, sort of have it digital live and over your, uh, your phone, you can do that as well. You'll see on the wall behind me on each side, each of our individual handles, uh, so you can find and follow us, not just tonight, but after this is over. And I can tell you, these are some very interesting folks. The best part about my job tonight is I've had a chance to sit with these guys, and I don't really care what they do for you. I got an hour and a half on them. <laughs> really cool. So let's see if we can continue the discussion that we started. I want to start out by uh, also asking that you feel free to be part of this. I think what we're going to do is kind of start with some general questions and comments, and then open it up to you. I think if you've got questions, these people have all worked on some very interesting areas of public policy, public affairs, products and services, organizations, all through the digital platform. And uh, I think you're in for, as I said, when I began a real treat. So having said that, let's, uh, let's start, and I'm going to ask a question. I'm also going to, in complete transparency, let you know that here at the Institute of Politics at St. Anselm, we are like the Hard Rock Cafe. We love all, serve all. This is a nonpartisan, bipartisan, all-partisan place. <laughs> so Democrats, Republicans feel welcome here. This morning, David Axelrod is here, as Neil said. Tomorrow, Governor Romney will be here. We, we serve all. That said, I am the Republican on the panel, and the rest of them are on the other team. <laughs> so, in an attempt for some balance here, we're going to have a little fun. But that said, uh, I'd like to just uh, kind of start this off by asking three of my three, our three guests tonight, who have done lots of work um, for the Democratic Party and various interest groups, organizations related to some of their activities. A really, really stacked question. Ryan, start us off. Which GOP candidate, because we've got one Democratic candidate right now, and we know who he is, and we'll get to him. Um, which GOP candidate do you think right now this early in the race is doing the best job, or any of them doing as good a job as the Democrats in social media and the digital aspect. Well, I, I two answers to this. My, my serious answer is that you know Mitt Romney is a, a smart, focused guy who's got a great uh, a digital campaign going, and, and and he runs it like a business. Uh, my second answer is John Huntsman because he says the funniest things on Twitter. He's he's the Republican I retweet. He's the Republican his call me crazy tweet. I've used that several times myself. So I, I think that uh, uh, both uh, uh, Romney and Huntsman are, are getting what's going on, on the internet. Julian, what do you think? And he stole my question, or my answer. Um, I, I would have to agree. And I think that uh, for me, from a social media perspective, the most compelling candidate in social media or on social media is John Huntsman, regardless of quantity or mm -hmm. size of followers. By, by, you know, we talk about social media, but in terms of digital, web presence, well, the amount of tweets, the right. blogging, what's going on out there, you think Huntsman's got most of the juice? No, I, w I would say that's, that's Romney. I mean, just look at the news that we just saw coming out from, from Twitter. I mean, Romney is now the first candidate that's paying to have these political ads in the form of tweets going out. Um, so he, As a fact, he let's means pause business. There for a word from Mitt Romney. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so I, I think that that was both innovative and very strategically smart on, on his campaign's part. So where's, where's, where's Herman Cain? That's what I want to know. <laughs> uh, just check under uh, hashtag 999. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Clay, what did you say you? 
Yeah, no fun here. I think uh, of the of the current candidates, Romney's the best, and and just looking at him from a full digital presence, the way he creates content, uh, and his campaign always has, whether it's you know blogging, whether it's YouTube videos, whether you know he he really does use a lot of channels. He's you know he's kind of known as an analytical guy that puts you know a lot into 180 page economic reports and things like that. But then he he brings those online, he makes them accessible for for search engines, things like that. So I think he's doing the best. But the best conservative, I think, and who who was kind of made for social media is Sarah Palin. I think I think she has done a great job at just not necessarily uh, always winning people over, but she certainly uh, <laughs> has a lot of followers, has engaged a lot of people, and has has pushed the national discourse, whether it's death panels or something else. That you know that came from social media. So, so hang on one second. So do you, are you saying that? <laughs> I know you have a thought on this, right? <laughs> Are you saying that Sarah Palin, is it her personality, is her brand? What is it about Sarah Palin that makes her so compelling in, in, in the digital space? Can I answer that? Well, I asked him, but go ahead. You get one steal per you panel. Is this your steal? You, yeah. you betcha. You betcha. You, you betcha. betcha. Uh, yeah, no, I, mean, I just wanted to be smart. <laughs> I think it's her, her personality and also, yeah, just her personality that she's going to say something that can be controversial and she's going to stand by it. And even if, you know, there are, you know, for the most controversial statement, there are going to be people who back her up and there are going to be people who firmly oppose her and that both of those people are going to comment and like a post or, or retweet it. And, and that's where that conversation is going to happen. So, let you... And so you've got Mitt Romney, the, the, the pro, right? And then you've got, you've got Sarah Palin, who is incredibly authentic in, in, in when, she, when she talks online. It's like when my mother writes a Facebook status. It, you know, there, it isn't, there isn't any strategy behind it. It's just what she was thinking. Um, so that's what makes her popular over social media, but that's the same way that some of the Real Housewives are popular. It's not, it's not that people look at her as like a thought leader in terms of policy, but she's able to amplify her, her content better well, than Well, and, and let's, let's make sure we're giving credit where credit's due. Uh, I don't think uh, Mitt Romney one day sat down with a book or Mashable.com and said, I'm going to get really good at Twitter. Right? It's, it's a lot of it in any professional campaign is where the resources are put. And if you're allocating the right resources and you're hiring the right people who really know their stuff, Mitt Romney's got a great digital team. Um, I don't know, I mean, none of us know how many tweets Mitt Romney is actually pushing out from his own BlackBerry. But I think there's a lot to be said for the people that are behind the team. All right. All right. So that said, let's, let's kind of segment here. As a guy who made a lot of money over his career in media commissions, Okay, um, we're uh, we're finding a huge shift in resources and campaigns. Um, tell me what you all have seen, not just in political campaigns, but also in referendum issues, public policy issues, grassroots issues. What's happening now when you run a contemporary campaign in terms of the budget, the resources to run a strong digital presence? Uh, so, so. I think there are a few ways to look at it. If we're just looking at the different types of campaigns, what I've seen, and I'll be interested to hear what you all say, um, issues and referenda are certainly willing to spend, spend more on digital than candidates. Um, and I think that's because they're, they're more short-lived and they want to make more of an impact in digital. Getting a middle and an end, yep. so, so, so they're really focused on that, where, whereas candidates are seeing it as more of a long haul and something that they can kind of in-house, where I think a lot of issue and referenda need someone now so they're willing to pay for that. And the, so, so that's where I see the breakdown in politics. Overall, you know, the magic number that we've been hearing uh, for the past four or five years is, is that people want to see digital at 10% and then keep growing. And a lot of the campaigns, and a lot of the candidates we're involved in, and, and y'all, I bet Ryan has different experiences, and, and maybe Julie Lynn, Julie Lynn do. I, we don't see it at 10% as often as it should be. There are some campaigns that allocate 30 or 40%, and uh, you know, sometimes that could be too much. It really depends campaign to campaign and, and who they're trying to connect with. You know, there are candidates that are a good match for social media and good match for digital, and there are candidates that should be sending nasty mailers. You know, it, it really just depends. Let's go back for a second. Um, Ryan, you worked on Howard Dean's campaign, and right. Al Gore claims to have invented the internet, but I claim that Howard Dean did, because what you guys did on that campaign in terms of monetizing the web, raising money, small dollar amounts, to, to, to uh, it turned into large dollar amounts, actually, collectively. But right. More importantly, mobilize people for Governor Dean. Tell us a little bit about that, because that wasn't that long ago, relatively speaking. No, this was two, this was 2004, and a lot of people, you know, it's it's easy to forget that in 2004 there was no YouTube, there was no Facebook, there there was no Twitter, none, none of this existed. 
Um, I, I, you know, I got involved in the Dean campaign from a Yahoo group. Uh, that I started in New York. You have a Yahoo group? Not anymore. Oh, I don't even know. If, I, don't, I don't know if Yahoo still exists. But, but <laughs> so we started this Yahoo group. So, so the, it was very sort of. Um, there wasn't the, the, the ability to organize was the tools were not there, which is sort of where the company I, I worked for came out of the Dean campaign, trying to you know come up with those tools. But the tools weren't there, so it was, it was a different time, uh, in, in a sense where we weren't quite sure how many people were going to give money online. Um, we weren't quite sure what. The, the, we knew how many supporters we had and how many states. We, we weren't quite sure how active they really were, which is why one of the reasons I had, they sent me to like 36 states around the country to meet with all the local meetup groups to see, are these really people there or are there just numbers being on a spreadsheet? So it, there was a lot of like uh, trying to figure out what was happening at, at that point. And, and as the campaign grew, uh, obviously the fundraising base grew and, and more and more people donated money. And we noticed that if someone donated $5, they they're more likely to donate Ten dollars next month, and fifteen a month after that. So you grow these small dollar donors. So you engaged, you sort of engaged fans at a low dollar, right? And kind of kept uh, a dialogue going with yeah. these folks. You want to make the barrier as low as possible. To get them yeah, in. get them in. Get and them take a piece of the franchise right. and an interest. Yeah, once once you've given five dollars, you're you're invested. You're interested. Well, how much money did, did Howard Dean raise over the web? Do you recall? You know, I don't. I don't mm -hmm. recall. I mean, big big numbers. I remember that one quarter when we raised seven point six million. Just in, say, yeah. it was over fifty. Yeah, it was it was it was an incredible amount of money. I mean, yeah, of was, course, Obama was like five hundred wow. million. You know, it's just see. I think it was one hundred and ten for yeah. Dean. But if you if you just look at that that graph, like <laughs> how people have become more responsive. Uh, the internet fundraising is unbelievable. Yeah, exactly. So I think what they did with the Dean campaign was such a turning point for politics in general. So we started our company in 2006, and it was... You saw you, that action in 2006. <laughs> yeah, we, what's 10% of 110 million? Exactly. <laughs> uh, so, so we saw that happen, and we realized, um, as, as a lot of people did, and there are a lot of companies that emerged from that, that right now there was still a barrier, and there was a lot of statewide campaigns, national campaigns doing it, but eventually that was going to trickle down, and every city councilman would want to raise five or ten dollars because the donors were donating those small dollars, so there was no reason that those smaller campaigns shouldn't be reaching out you to them. You can't run for dog catcher now without a micro site, right? All right. Or, or a, well, a Facebook page. Or a Facebook page, right? Yeah, right. I, I would say for me, the difference between a good campaign, not so whether it's uh, you know dog catcher or president, is the level in which they engage their supporters. If you have a really well-run, engaged campaign, so I, as someone, as a practitioner, my daily philosophy, my mantra is organizing engagement campaigns. So instead, when basically what that means is I want to treat individuals not as voters. Hopefully you're all registered to vote. But what I want to do is I want to treat you, I want to engage you as a whole person. So I recognize, other than just having an opinion about who you want to vote for, it's uh, do you go to church? Do you have a dog? You know, do you have a family? Are you engaged in your workplace? And using kind of as much information as I can get about you to engage you through the issues outside of the one campaign that I may be working on to, to you know, a, a much more holistic approach. And so I think that, you know, with the issue campaigns, back to your question about the grassroots, I think the issue campaigns rely more upon organic supporters and organic um, digital buzz, if you will. That, we, that we'll have talk about a, a, that kind of campaign. Let's talk a little bit about what that means because sure. there are political campaigns and then there are these referenda sort of campaigns where you're looking to pass something, to have the legislature pass something, or create an air war around a ground war for a lobbying effort. Can you give us some examples of stuff you've been involved <laughs> with that you consider to be yeah. best practice? And successful as opposed to yeah well I'll give you a great example last cycle I spent in Arizona um, working to help raise the Latino voter turnout following the passage of SB 1070 which is a very controversial bill that passed the Arizona State Legislature and as a result uh, there was a huge concern that Latino voters would not turn out and we were concerned about things like voter intimidation and, and other you know basic civil rights issues and we did not have a lot of money you know, we, didn't, we couldn't afford to run a lot of Google ads or Facebook ads or stuff like that. And so the emphasis was put upon our field team, which was all volunteers, to go out and not just sign people, you know, get people to sign up on the dotted line, but figure out what was it that they were, you know, what was their connection? You know, all of us, 
the, the part of the reason that whether you like him or agree with him or not, that the Obama campaign of 08 was so successful is that people felt they connected to the candidate, right? So most of us are probably not black men from Chicago. I know I'm not. Uh, but there was something about his story. He's from story. Kenya, actually. Right, right, <laughs> wherever. <laughs> We've already let it go. Was that there was something about his story that I connected with. And so it gets back to, yes, it's new technology, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a practice that's been done for thousands of years, the art of storytelling. So, so, so the political narrative. Absolutely. We used to tell on television and in mail. Yep. And we used to tell in town hall meetings. We still do in New Hampshire especially. Yep. But this is really just another medium. Right. I mean, you walk around these halls and we see these amazing photographs of, you know, Jack Kennedy. And what was it that people felt about him? You know, a record turnout. So, so why did people, you know, whether you were alive or somebody you were related to, what, what was that issue that they felt so connected to that campaign? Was it they could see themselves in his shoes? Or they saw the promise of the American dream in him? Right? So it's, it's all about that connection. And, and whether you're doing that through a Facebook ad, whatever that initial entry point is that you have to that voter, the most important thing, and I would hope that, or guess that the two guys here would agree with me, is keeping those supporters. And how do you keep them? Is it through YouTube videos, tweets, stuff like that? So, so content is streamed with regularity. We engage in a, in, a, in a dialogue instead of a monologue. What was the net net, do you think, on Latino GOTV, turning out the vote or identifying the vote, do you know? Uh, I think in Arizona it was the, we're not going to let that stop us be the people that we are, which is Americans, you know, and that we're Arizonans too. And regardless of how we got here, you know, or how our grandparents got here, um, we have just as much of a, a stake in this, in what happens in our state and our community as anyone else. Okay. Streaming live from the, the people at Live Free or Die Alliance, the Live Free or Die Alliance is, uh, is taping tonight and, and uh, streaming our discussion. Uh, uh, you can follow us, if you would like, on Twitter, um, and, and that is N-H-I-O-P-S-M is our, is our hashtag for tonight, and we encourage people to do that. How are we doing back there, Caitlin? You got anything for me yet? All right, I'll come back, but just raise your hand. Oh, we have one question. Go ahead, read it out. Now, wait a minute. Edit it first, then read it out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we have one um, from the Virtual Town Hall and the Live Free or Die Alliance from Kendra Mack, a UNH student. What do you believe is ethical in terms of deleting or cens censoring comments hostile towards a candidate or social issues on social networking sites? Do you consider it an infringement on free speech? Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, we all, we all want to take that one, right? I, <laughs> it's really, really complicated. Because I put up a website, you know, there's no free freedom of speech to come on my website and write whatever you want. That's that's not what freedom of speech means. So it's not a freedom of speech issue when you're when you're dealing with deleting comments. Uh, the rule of thumb that I I, I try to use is uh, th that we're all here to have a debate, have a discussion about an issue, and as long as we don't uh, resort to uh, you know attacks that are just uh, uh, completely unacceptable, you know, attacking someone's race or so sexuality or their gender, if they're as long as these these the comments are about the topic. I say leave them up and let and let your supporters defend your positions. Um, th that's that's my opinion. Yeah, I actually think you have a richer on online community because if your supporters are truly out there, they they will in fact they will say uh, actually no, you're wrong or this is why you know X X and Z happen. Um, and I think it also it shows a level of maturity of a campaign or an organization that has faith in their supporters. Um, because if you have a good online community, they got your back. In the Dean campaign, we always talked about this, the self, the self-organizing, the self-censoring community, where people would say, "Hey, that's not that's not cool for this for this blog." So, so that's a blog <clears throat> or something that people are, people might tweet. Let's talk about how many people here have a Twitter account. How many people here have a Facebook page? Okay. So we talked about this earlier. Uh, we talked a little bit of the fact that. Twitter is, is really trends a little older. There are young people on Twitter, but there's also old guys like me of my generation that have adopted Twitter as a means of communicating. Um, Facebook, I, I'm just going to ask you a question. As the father of two college-age sons, mm. both of whom are still tuition dependent, so please buy my book. Uh, <laughs> the, the, both of them 
um, have blocked Facebook pages. Or in other words, they're, they're key, they're password. There's got to be a way to get in, your friends have way. Um, there's also a responsibility on all of us who engage in social media or the digital space uh, today to, if, if content is allowed to flow freely, and self-regulation is part of this thing, to also protect oneself. And I'm not trying to do the, the cyber police here, but is there really self-regulation in some of the campaign stuff? This gets pretty heated. We, we have a hard time getting candidates to be civil to one another in exchanges during debates. How do you do that in the digital space? So, that one's me. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think it's tough. And I think, you know, I think it goes back to what they were just saying with the previous question, but I think it's about setting a tone and, and putting your campaign, you know, making you the mark to hit and, and saying, you know, setting the tone for how you're going to interact with the other campaigns uh, in a digital world and, and then expecting them to do the same. And, and I would add to the others, you know, we, we advise our clients to leave just about every comment up um, and not just because the community will police it, because they will, but also, I mean, it can be a great mechanism to <laughs> get fundraisers, to volunteers. It can really mobilize people if, even if it is, you know, the, 0.01% of humanity who is leaving that comment. If you can, if you can take that and, and try and personify your your opponent or the other party as this is what they believe, we have to. We can't let this stand. It's unacceptable. Give five dollars to prevent stuff like this. Yeah. Then, then that uh, it can really become a rallying cry and actually go from being something that I think. Four years ago, people were really worried about and could see as being detrimental because it was on their blog. To now, you know, it's a mobilizing tool. And sure, le leave ugly things on, on my Facebook page. Leave, uh, you know, tweet terrible things to me. Leave bad comments on my blog because I'm going to use them against Who you. Up there, buddy? Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. To, uh, but yeah, so so I mean, I think if you set the bar high, the other campaign should respect it. And if they don't. Well, then you're probably in a power position. You know, but but a, a smart candidate who does not get in a lot of mainstream media attention can can use Twitter and Facebook to throw bombs, and that's what you see Huntsman doing when he when he called everybody out on being anti-science. Nobody was covering Huntsman. All of a sudden, he tweeted, and and then I would see on CNN Huntsman tweets, and it's like the guy's been speaking for two months. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and just was it last week with the the latest debate? You know, Huntsman. I think I think he was the only candidate that issued a statement after the debate, following the very controversial issue with the the gay soldier. He he was I think it was him and one other guy who. Yeah. yeah. That that alone made news. Whether or not you know you agreed with it, the fact that he so came out. So let me ask you this: the terrestrial media creates opportunities, or candidates go out in a, in a virtual world today, and we talked about this earlier too. There is no way for a candidate running for public office to not be in the spotlight. How many people have mobile phones with them tonight? Okay. There's no way anybody running for anything can go out and speak to a Rotary Club somewhere, no matter what you're running for, without somebody taking a video, posting it on YouTube. We go without any, you know, there's no nets anymore. Yeah. So let me ask you this. If, 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 if something occurs in a debate, Huntsman then uses the post-debate period to say, should have said, oh boy, if I had only, you know, we all do that. Yeah. I wish I had said, Twitter sort of gives you the opportunity to tweet something out and say, we should do this and we should respect and we should. Then the media covers it. Let's talk about how YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, what you blog and post winds up covered by the media, the mainstream media. So for me, the most famous example uh, from 2006 uh, uh, Senate race, Virginia, George <laughs> Allen, the Macaca moment. Um, you know, that was the very first YouTube gotcha video uh, that, that really took a candidate who, who was going to be, a lot of people thought was going to be the nominee in, right. for the Republican uh, presidential in 2008. And uh, his whole campaign basically imploded because he used this kind of bizarre old <laughs> word. And uh, somebody caught it on YouTube and put it on YouTube. And then, and then you know, MSNBC and, and then CNN, everybody just started yeah. playing it nonstop. So that, that's a really good example of how new media can, can transfer it to the old media and, and be amplified. And I think, too, so, so I mean, that's a great example of an intentional gotcha moment that they had this tracker on them for all of that time. And, and, and there have been a lot of reports, and there are super PACs coming out that say they're going to make that priority this year, are tracking people with cameras. But you have to be aware everywhere. The thing I like to look at is you know, the most secret history in the most secret military mission history was live tweeted by some IT guy in Abbottabad. 
right? And, and he, you know, I hear helicopters over me, things like that. And, and so right. you can be making news without, they don't need to know you're a candidate. You know, if you're just a jerk to someone at McDonald's, they, can, they could tweet it and then it gets out there. So candidates not only have to be on when they're on the campaign trail, it can be anywhere. And, and that applies to everyone. I saw a tweet today from uh, a, a guy I follow who writes for uh, a major newspaper. And he said, he was in Iowa today, and his tweet was, Kid at Burger King on Route 3, Register 2, really courteous, great representation of the brand. Now, that's really cool, because it says to me that somebody at Burger King is going to monitor that tweet and say, let's look at the register, which kid was on Register 2? They, they should give him a free Whopper or something. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I mean, corporate, corporations pay millions and millions of dollars, right, for that buzz. Um, and, you know, anybody, do you guys have Comcast here in New Hampshire? Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody ever had a negative experience with Comcast? Mm -hmm. Right. Haha. -ha, exactly. Right. They have hired. I mean, they were one of the first companies to make a, a kind of big publicity, but they hired a whole team to do nothing but monitor Twitter uh, to people who were having bad experiences, and then they would, you know, direct message them and say, "Send us your number. We'll call you. Let us fix that." Right. And so then they got press because they were trying to rectify this terrible public image that they had. Um, the, the fact is, is that buzz is the one thing that every campaign, corporation, whatever, always goes after. And you can spend millions, and they do, of dollars, but if you don't have a good plan and you don't have a great strategy and a team, it's all for naught. Let's talk about access again. Um, so, so mainstream media, when, when, when Brian Williams reports that, let me get this right, that other mainstream media are reporting a story about someone who did something. Mm -hmm. It can be a celebrity, a politician, whatever. Um, often mainstream media will couch it as the National Enquirer today, or a News Weekly, or a tabloid publication set. It then becomes news. There's a little bit of a veil there that the mainstream media starts covering this stuff that would be sort of unseemly. What's the, what stops stuff on the web? A photograph, a picture, a statement, something someone said out of context. I was with Mark Halpern last week at, at Harvard. He started his seminar by saying to all the people in the room who were live tweeting, make sure you get what I say right, because I don't want to be bombarded with emails and tweets. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's had bad luck saying yes, bad he things. Has. <laughs> <laughs> he has. But well, what do you guys think about that? Is there a way to, how do you protect yourself in a digital age where you know you're, you're exposed and you're a candidate and your footprint is forever, that stuff doesn't get pulled down and taken away. Yeah, I think it's um, you know yeah. There's no hope in hiding a lot of things, so I think it is a, a cultural thing and, and a responsibility of a lot of the mainstream media to start pro progressing and realize you know what is real news versus what is not, and that you know I'm not up here to draw a line because it's a very hard thing to answer and it's it's not. It's not really a fair thing to thrust on these organizations, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, um, you know, if they're putting something on the front page that, that's a tweet taken out of context or something like that, it obviously doesn't belong there. But in today's world, you can't take that back because the ramifications have already happened. In, in, in 10 years, we will not have congressmen resign because of shirtless pictures of them appearing on the internet. That just won't ever happen. And, and people will say, that that was a crazy thing that happened 10 because years ago. we're going to have a generation of congressmen. No, we have a whole, like if you, if no one under 30 can ever run for office, then that's the rule. If well, that's the rule, no one under 30 can well, run for no, office. Okay, so we have a lot of students in the audience. So how many of you who've either already this in college This could be a dangerous now, question. No, 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 no. I, this, is the, this is the PG rated version, I promise. So Extra. how many of you have had, no. How many of you have had someone, an academic advisor or something, tell you, make sure you go and take a look at your profile and you know, either protect your photos or, or if, if somebody has written something that you wouldn't your mo want your mom to see, you know, take it down. Has anybody gotten that advice from somebody? Advice? High school, college? Yeah. I mean, You've got corporations and campaigns spending a lot of money screening people, right? And so I, I hope that we do kind of shift because on one hand, you can argue that social media gives us the ability to, to be who we are, right? We're not a Stepford community. I hope, I hope we're not. Um, we, we have flaws and imperfections, and supposedly we're told that's what makes us you know, beautiful and individual. Um, and so the argument is, is if we can't be the, who we are online, 
then what's the point? Yeah, it, it really is. I, there was an article the other day. I haven't read it yet. <laughs> but it, was in, it was in the Atlantic, and it was called uh, The Cheating Politician and His Wife. And it's just about, yeah. so I read the first couple paragraphs. <laughs> it, but, I mean, it's just about you know, how times have changed, and the media used to be more willing to not ask those type of questions to, to a lot of past politicians. Now it's at the forefront. There, there's really no barrier, and that they'll ask that blunt question, have you been faithful? But there was this time when the, when the, when the media was, wasn't willing to do it. Like, when, when people say that they're mostly thinking of like JFK. Right. right? But when, when Jefferson did it, when, when Jefferson was sleeping with Sally, that was on the front page of every, of every newspaper so in the just, country. Let me, let me just stop this for a second. Because the, the, the Kennedy campaign, as we look back on, on, on the Kennedy administration and the campaigns and so forth, there's been plenty written and speculated and so on and so forth. But back then, the, the, the days of the boys on the bus that we used to talk about, sort of the, the, the guys, you know, Johnny Apple and the guys who used to cover these campaigns the old-fashioned way, it was an understanding, right? Yeah. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was rarely photographed in, in his braces or in his wheelchair. It just wasn't done. Um, was it, were we better served by that? What do you guys think in terms of, I mean, that's, isn't that sort of, <coughs> editing content for uh, and not truth in journalism? I mean, what, what's, are we better off today or not? It might look better on the cover of Life magazine, but you know, the academics will tell you that we want transparency, right? And if you want to know, I mean, whether it's you're asking for candidates tax returns or you're, you know, trying to figure out are they faithful to your wife? You know, everybody, different things matter to different people. Um, I mean, sometimes it's a little scary for me. You know, there's, there's been some interesting articles out of late that talking about that the person who you are on your social media outlets is not actually who you are. It's the image that you want projected of yourself. Right, here we go. So, I've heard this from some younger folks in my firm. They talk about their personal brand. Right. We talk about the Romney brand, the Obama brand, the Palin brand. Right. Like we're selling ketchup. What does that mean? Why are we all so self-absorbed that we have to have our personal brand? Is that... What is that? Is that just... What's the name of your company again? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Um, hashtag N-H-I-O-P-S-M. So you can follow us. Do that. And Nate, I think we've got a question from outside of the auditorium, right? Uh, we do. Um, from a recent grad uh, from St. Anselm College at Ben Bradley, uh, what role will social media play in the 2012 presidential election, and will it be effective, effective in making or breaking the outcome? I don't think I'll play any role. The internet's dead. Um, I, I think it will play a role. What I think for me is going to be the most interesting part is how the candidates respond to the use of social media. You know, we saw last cycle, we saw YouTube town halls, right? So. Twitter town hall, are we gonna are we gonna get softball questions? Are candidates gonna actually have to answer tough questions or are they they're gonna, you know, the campaign manager's gonna huddle over and say, Well we wanna answer these five. Right? Kinda I mean that's how they do debates mm -hmm. right now. They they have agreed upon rules. Right. So is it gonna turn into the Wild West? I think it makes a really interesting viewing. Um, <laughs> Will it happen? I'm not sure, but, but whether it's Foursquare or Gowalla, whatever kind of location-based social networking um, system you might be using, or Twitter, or you know, this new timeline that we're getting excited about for Facebook, <laughs> um, I, think, I think it's going to change things, but I also think that, meant, that means that a lot more money is going to be spent on the digital side of things. For me, one of the interesting things, I mean, obviously, I think it'll play a huge role. I <laughs> think we, we hope all so, think yeah. <laughs> it'll play a huge role. Transparency. Um, yeah. uh, for me, one of the interesting things is that I think its role. I think in the past it was, in the, in when I say in the past, I just mean the last campaign. It was almost a more explicit thing where you had to go into Facebook, you had to go into Twitter, you had to go into YouTube to find these things, and now they're all kind of converging and, and kind of flattening. And there's the social web being integrated with everything. So. You know, being in Facebook or Aaron Grade, you don't have to go into Facebook to see if your friend likes a candidate. If you, you know, if if you're in New Hampshire and you know you search Governor Romney, you're going to see which of your friends already like them. Those things are if becoming. If you're searching on Bing, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anything can happen. But, but, but I mean, you know, a, as those layers get removed, and, and that's what you know all of the last F8 was about, continuing to remove these layers and integrate everything. Um, you know, it's just it's going to be 
it's going to play such a more massive role because it's not just you know the candidate. You have to go into Twitter to see what the candidate said, or you have to be on Facebook every day to understand that it, social media is becoming the web, and, and that's what we've been saying. We're here to talk about you know digital and the web, and social media is a part of that and is a very large part of that, but but they're they're one the same at this point. Let me just ask a question of the audience in the, in the auditorium here. How many folks follow political candidates? We're in New Hampshire. Anybody following any campaigns? And by follow, we don't mean you show up at the restaurant they announce they're going to be at on Twitter. Right. But I mean, follow what they're posting, what their, their blogs or their, what they're posting on the website and what's, what they're putting up on Twitter. Okay. How many of you, keep your hands up if you're following a candidate, any candidate, just keep your hands up. How many of you believe that your candidate is posting those tweets, him or herself? Yeah. <laughs> Before or after you came in this room? <laughs> well, no, but I, I think it's interesting because I think we all agree. Yeah. Although President Obama has indicated that he does, and the, and the White House confirms that occasionally he does actually tweet stuff out. Well, so, this has been a shift too, because the the Obama the Barack Obama uh, Twitter account was managed by by staff and DNC, and uh, it's still managed by uh, Obama campaign staff. Uh, but now when, when the president tweets, he, he, he comments the initials B.O. afterwards, so mm -hmm. you know that it's an actual tweet from the, the president. So that, that, that's an attempt to add some authenticity to, to that handle, which I think has been really effective. But speaking of authenticity, if, if you were to peel back the layer of a campaign and, and see when we're talking about social media, even the mechanics from inside the campaign have changed when it comes to tweeting, right? Because before say four years ago, you had to get sign off perhaps from the communications director who was not the same person that was the new media director, if you had a new media director, right? And that had to be approved probably by the candidate themselves. And now we're even more so in a 24-7, you know, instantaneous social media ADD, you know, kind of world. And so that's why these higher level campaigns have to pay so much money to be able to have people that they completely trust who are completely indoctrinated with the campaign message and brand that they can be pushing out these tweets and these Facebook posts and everything like that on a, on a wholesale level. The exception I would add, not on a presidential level, but is Rahm Emanuel. Rahm Emanuel became the first mayor, or Chicago mayor, on Foursquare. And on, you know, he's doing all this stuff now on Twitter. Um, you know, if you followed the, the fake Rahm Emanuel, that was that was very entertaining. And so, you know, what we're kind of seeing is is how much is, how much leverage or how much uh, license is he going to take with that? Uh, New York New York Mayor Bloomberg was on Foursquare first, but uh, oh well, Mashable said it was oh. Rahm, so I apologize. You guys can keep this going. Your <laughs> <laughs> name is mentioned. You have the right to respond. That's the right. <laughs> Um, but I mean, I, I think it's I think it's some fascinating stuff. It, then the argument I've seen arguments to say, well, so does that mean that the office holder is actually not doing their job if they are tweeting, right? Other people would argue that they're absolutely doing their job because they're providing instantaneous updates of and, and being accountable and showing real, true transparency the minute it happens. But to say that the, uh, the 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 candidate or the the government official isn't doing their job because they're tweeting is as stupid an argument as saying the the, <laughs> the candidate isn't doing their job because they wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post. I mean, it's completely just this bizarre. You know, right. the, the media. It's not the medium. It's the message. So I I completely agree. I'm just saying. I mean, it's it's like any issue. You're going to have. Yeah. And I think what we're getting at is at the core. I think I think all of us believe that a candidate should actually be responsible for some of their social media presence. They don't need to tweet 100% of the time, and they shouldn't. And it's not because they won't be doing their job, but it's, <laughs> it's because they might be at an event or some, or you know, there's part of a broader message that they might not even be briefed on that, that the campaign you know, just sent an email blast and they're trying to follow it up with a tweet, whatever it is. But a candidate, you know, we're firm believers that a candidate should be tweeting on their own occasionally and, and you know, not just for authenticity of the account, but I think people really enjoy that. Like you were saying, people really enjoy knowing that a tweet came from the president. One of the, you know, we work with a congressional, uh, a congressman in Colorado, and he was really hesitant to get on Twitter, and the campaign was really worried about it. And within three weeks, he was tweeting about, you know, his girls' basketball games that he was at. And, and people love that. People are responding. Yeah. Yeah, Julie Lynn was talking about earlier, you know, why did people uh, want 
you know, associate themselves so strongly with JFK? Was it the American dream? Did they see themselves in him? You know, this is just another window where you can, you can give a look at a candidate, make them human, and help people associate with you. So I have an interesting story for you. Go ahead. So I don't know how many of you folks have heard of a guy named Pete Hoekstra. He's a former congressman from Michigan. Uh, he used to serve on, when he was in the um, House, he served on the Intelligence Intelligence Committee or the Armed Services, no, Armed Services Senate. Okay, anyways, he was, he was on the Intelligence Committee or something like that. And so he uh, went with the State Department to Afghanistan or Iraq, somewhere in the Middle East. You guys know what I'm talking about? He was, it was a secret mission, and he committed a major faux pas because while he was there, he tweeted about being there. And also, I was, <gasps> you know, first of all, he wasn't even supposed to be on this trip, and then he tweets about it, right? So about three weeks after that happens, he and I are sitting in a green room about to do this show. We we're taping two different segments for uh, a, you know, a, news, a news show. And he pulls out his Blackberry. And me, being the snarky former blogger I am, said, oh, Congressman, are you, are you tweeting? And he goes, yeah, it's just the darndest thing. He goes, half the time I don't even know what I'm doing with this thing. And he goes, did you know that if you put number sign, T-C-O-T, that like more people see it, and so he was referring to a hashtag that a lot of conservatives use to organize number their sign. I like that. number sign. And I just thought, you know, you give so you know they've given him this tool and they've told him to use it, and he commits this major faux pas that could have put troops at risk, right? One could argue, but then he, you know, he's sitting next to me and he's like, I don't even really know what I'm doing with it, and it's so. You know, and, and I saw a snarky tweet during the, the debt ceiling debate. Well, how many you know, congressmen are fooling around on Twitter or their Blackberries or taking pictures of themselves when they should be out you know, right. figuring out what's going on? So I think there's also an issue of responsibility by not only our, our political institutions, but to also educate people how to use this. You know? Mm -hmm. um, it, hang on one second, Ron. If anyone has a question in the auditorium, I want you to just raise your hand. Oh, we got some questions. Good. Okay. This poor lady over um, here has had her I'm hand sorry, up for a I while. I'm sorry. I can't see that far. But would you still tell us who you are and ask this question? Hi. We'll come back. My name is Shayla McGreevy Scheip. Graduated a long time ago. Um, Welcome back. Thanks. Um, I'm doing a lot of work, and I'm just and I have my master's in computer science from RIB too in Nashua. And I'm just wondering, like, what's your must-haves for a campaign, for a Twitter campaign, or, or online, and what is your wish list if you're setting up an issues campaign? Uh, a must-have tools, like oh, tools? tools. Besides Twitter, like, what are you using? Yeah. To, well, I, I think it. A big part of this is understanding who your audience is, right? If your target audience is blue-collar, you know, older, uh, you know, skews older age then you're probably not going to want to get as crazy fancy with all these newfangled tools. Um, but if you are you know, doing, if you're doing a youth initiative or something like that, you, would, you change it up. But I mean, must-haves are absolutely Twitter uh, and Facebook. I mean, at the end of the day, and then I would add building relationships with bloggers, bloggers that matter. Not all bloggers matter. So also understanding what bloggers play in that space that you are are you know in, and building relationships with them. And, and I would extend that past bloggers and say people who are influential on Twitter and, oh, and yeah, Facebook, absolutely. sort of the right. you know. But yeah. but as the tools. Exactly. Yeah. And were you talking about specific tools also yeah. for yeah? So so if you're looking at specific tools, you know, through which to, to leverage those networks, I would you know things that come to mind right away are you know TweetDeck is an easy free solution. Google Analytics, easy free solution Hootsuite. where you can see how people are using it. Yeah, Hootsuite, easy free solution. You know, in a in an ideal world you've got some really robust tools out there like a Radiant Six that that provides kind of twenty four seven, three sixty monitoring and you can see, you know, what the conversation is, uh, should you be paying attention to these people, are they centers of influence? Uh, and, and should you be responding, you can you know, really quickly, instantaneously, know if you've got a, a crisis on your hands and, and you need to be out there managing your reputation. So, so that, that's probably, that's the Cadillac, or Mercedes, <laughs> and the rest are. I I think Radiant 6 is one of them. I mean, we've seen a few. We, we've used Radiant Live, 6 Live for, World is great yeah. for monitoring. Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of them. Ra Radiant 6 tends to, to not be cheap. Um, right, but, exactly. But the, 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 tool is, the tool is incredible. Yeah. Right, that's your question? That's great. Okay, great. Someone else over here. Yes, ma'am. Bye. Hi. So earlier, Julia, you said something about communications director and new media director. <laughs> yes. 
And I'm wondering, have we reached convergence at this point? Are we, are we to where there's no difference anymore? And if we're not, should we be? Oh, this question. Uh, <laughs> um, my answer is hopefully yes, but it also depends on who's running the campaign and how much trust they have in someone and how much work there is to do. You know, I'm, I'm managing a statewide initiative right now in a state full of 8 million people. And I mean, I could use four extra pairs of hands, right, for all I have to do. Um, but I also work with a communications director. Yeah, and, and oh, sh oh, she needs a job? Okay, we should talk. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I would like to think that one day we are there, but very, very important point, and I, I think this is an absolute must admit from a, new, a recovering new media director, is that new media and communication are not the same thing. Communication is about developing a message and figuring out how you use that message over and over and over again. A new media director, in my mind, is responsible for taking that message and pushing it through as many venues and through as, you know, with as many opportunities as possible. If you can be one in the same, which on smaller down ticket races you often are, then that is great. But when you are running a statewide or a national campaign, I think, I think it really just depends. And, and sometimes 10 heads are better than one, but I think it just depends on the people and the issue. But so we're, we're not, we talk a lot in our business about being media agnostic in terms of pushing the message. Are we in fact, media agnostic yet? Or is there still in politics, in public policy, kind of a, a hierarchy of traditional media, then new media? I mean, I've, I've seen a shift in our business. Adam, I'm not sure what you all see, but. Yeah, uh, so I think there has been a shift, but I think there is I think there's still, especially in larger campaigns, I think there's a hierarchy. And, and I, I think it's yeah. exactly what Julie Lynn was saying in that communications is so much broader. And also, you know, if you're on a statewide campaign or a national campaign, a lot of the job of that communications director is having already established relationships with the press and things like that. And your new media director shouldn't necessarily be as worried about that. And, and they, they maybe shouldn't even be of the age where they have that valuable of relationships. Um, so, so I think there is still a hierarchy where um, especially in larger campaigns where the new media director, I wouldn't even put them parallel. It's probably a little under communications director, but, but they're coming up there. I'm going to yeah. disagree. Okay, go for it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what we know from uh, Pluff's book, the, the Audacity to Win, is one of, the, one of the changes that Obama made when, when he had his campaign was that the, the digital director had a seat at the table. So he was with the political director, he was the communications director, and had the ability to weigh in on, on, on messaging. And, and yeah. you know, when you're developing a message, you can say, hey, wait, that message is not going to play over Facebook, or that message is not going to play digitally. That's something that a communications director might not know. So I, if I was putting together a campaign team right now, hmm. I would sit my digital director right next to my communications director, and they would, they would have parallel. So, so I, I, I agree with that. My table, <laughs> my, table, nice work. Yeah. my table would be uh, choreographed the same way. The, the thing about that is, in my mind, a communications director puts together the basic tenets of the message. And my job as an immediate director is to figure out how to take that message and either translate it or, I guess translate it would be the best word, to fit the appropriate medium, right? So how do you take a press release, which is often four to five paragraphs and a page long, and put that into a relevant Facebook post, right? That's, that's almost like speaking two different languages. You know, you've got the keywords that hopefully your pollsters have told you, you know, pull well. Um, but, but then you don't treat journalists the same way as you treat you know, your Facebook members. Um, as somebody who used to be a, a fairly well-known blogger in, you know, in, the, in the state that I was in, um, I wanted to have the same respect as a journalist, but I also understood that I had a different role than a journalist. In, in many ways, a threat to journalists who are filing, on, <laughs> not in real time, but filing under different deadlines, which is a whole other yeah. reason that we're here. Yes, sir. Uh, just a quick question. We've been talking a lot about authenticity mm. uh, in terms of the engagement between candidates and their constituents. Does social, uh, just to get your feelings on this, does social media actually help in the promotion of democratic ideals and civic engagement among voters, or are we really running into a problem where they just 
understand that that authenticity is not fully there as it should be when you compare it with face-to-face -face communication at a town hall or something like that. <laughs> I think we all have an answer, but go ahead. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'll be short. <laughs> but uh, I think it's certainly helping. And if I think one way to look at it is even if you're maybe judging a candidate's tweets as being filtered and not necessarily coming straight from them, I think where it's really playing a role is helping to organize voters and, and helping you know, to coalesce people around a topic that I might not have known that there was someone down the street that felt the same way and I find, find out in my Yahoo group or <laughs> whatever it is. Um, and, and so that's the way I think it's really helping you know, spur the process, pull new people into this and engage them. We were talking earlier um, about how social media is really exciting a new generation of voters um, and, and you know, primaries are notoriously older voters, but, but now with social media, people are starting to have fun following along with this and, and participating in the debate where they might not have before. I would say the example I would give is, um, this is a sad example for me, how many of you remember John Edwards? <laughs> um, John Edwards had a um, apple pie recipe contest. I believe correctly. <laughs> and I if you donated, um, you would be entered, or you got, you were, you were sent uh, his mother's apple pie recipe, right? How do you beat an apple pie from, from North Carolina? It's probably better than one from anywhere else. And I remember hearing um, from actually a, a family friend who said, you know, that's just really so nice that John cares about his mother like that, and he thinks so highly of her cooking. I just never knew what a nice young man he was. Right? Now, that was not at all the opinion I had. I thought, oh, that's a great gimmick, right? That's, that's really smart. But so for some people, it allows them to feel like the candidate that they see on the newspaper and the, t the, the TV shares the same values and is right, maybe right next to them. You know, President um, Obama is famous now for doing this, you know, chip in and you'll be entered to win to have dinner with me. Right, and so kind of that access that people might not feel normally, I think they feel, but it, but yeah, to a certain degree, it also will. It's just you know through an electronic medium. How real can that be? I don't think you can ever beat face-to-face -face communication. Absolutely, hands down, cannot. I, I hope we can beat it one day, but but um, <laughs> I, I actually think that the, the the pie recipe ended up being like a. a do you remember this? It, 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 was it plant. peanut butter pie? Okay. But it wasn't, okay. It, wasn't it purchased from, it wasn't even like a real recipe, it was like from a book? I almost think it was you mean in the John Edwards was being disingenuous? I think he might have been. <laughs> Let's not talk about it. Yeah, no, it might have happened. But, no, I'm, right, my point is is that I wasn't saying it was good or bad. I was just oh, saying... I think it was, it was a good move. It was yeah, a smart but, but digital this play. ordinary woman that I would not call a politically savvy or otherwise very engaged person saw that one thing and thought, wow, that's well, there was a such a nice there was a young man. You know, it's not like he helped a, an older woman walk across the street. He so let me ask you this, because I think your question is interesting, not just about campaigns, but let's take a look at the global reach that the internet has. A and I refer to the Arab Spring. I refer to um, what we find in emerging democracies across the world. Much of it we hear today about Twitter revolutions, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of a fascinating thing that in China and other places, it's hard to keep a lid on democracy when people do have free speech, even if they have to do it quietly. What, what all do you say about uh, the role of uh, social media, uh, let's say the digital space, but, but especially when one of these gets in the hands of somebody who's desperate to do something, to amass action? Let's start with Bill Gates down in the end. <laughs> Why am I the designated starter on <laughs> this? I thought sin last meant last. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think you answered your own question. <laughs> I, think, I don't know if I did, because I, I, I'm curious as to, is this, a, is this something we're going to see longer term, do you think, or is it a, is it a flash in the pan? No, no, I think, it, I think it's something that is really uh, restructuring the way the world communicates and the world organizes. So, um, you know, it used to be, with a sit-in or something, you could walk down the street and tell 10 people, let's have a sit-in. In some countries, you're not allowed to do that. You know, luckily, we, we are here. Um, but by using these, these media that can't necessarily be controlled by state government, you can start to organize on that grander scale. And I, I, you know, we saw, if you're curious if it'll continue into the future, I mean, we saw it spread from Tunisia to Egypt to Libya to Syria. I mean, it, 
it's still going. It, it wasn't just a flash and pan. I mean, we're going on, I don't know, six months now, eight months of the Arab Spring. To London, to Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Ohio? Yeah, you're exactly right. Well, yeah, okay. So, so you can talk about that directly because you've been involved <laughs> in some of these labor issues. Yeah. So, so in the Midwest, there's this huge battle over workers' rights and, and you know, what that looks like, legislati leg legislation being introduced and passed by state legislatures. and and what's fascinating to me is, you know, when this first started bubbling in the Midwest, I actually remember reading tweets and, and hearing kind of anecdotally people in Wisconsin saying, this is our, you know, this is our revolution, right? And they were talking, they were referencing what was happening in the Middle East. Then in Michigan, and so you saw pictures, anybody see the pictures of the tractors in Madison driving around the Capitol, right? Like tractors. You know, so then in Michigan, I hear people say, we want our Wisconsin moment, right? So now it's this, you know, like, pass it on moment. Um, and I think, it, you know, when you look at what happened in Iran, um, they shut down the internet, right, to try to stop this. Like, that's amazing. And yet still, thank you, Twitter, they were able to send tweets out because they required so little data to get out. Um, so I think it gets back to a larger issue of our governments. You know, uh, they've been talking about legislation here in Congress. You know, if something happens, do we do we shut off the internet? C could that be a possibility, right? So then, if you want to talk about free speech, so so let me ask you an ethical question. If uh, we've been through a lot in this country, uh, particularly in the Bush administration, regarding the Patriot Act and these issues of privacy, is there ever a case? And this is like asking if we should have free speech, but is there ever a case where you could see the government in a republic like this one having to shut down the internet? San Francisco BART already happened this year. But I'm talking about, yeah, that's a, a local example. Right, but, it, but it's an example of an agency <clears throat> taking a very bizarre step to, to, to stop communication for, for, for no apparent reason. And that, that happened. For a short time. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, you, you, can, you can talk around it, but it, it did happen. Well, and what's happening on Wall Street? I mean, there were concerns that, that either email was being blocked or Twitter wasn't trending the way it should have been as a result of uh, these Occupy Wall Street stuff that was happening. Shut out of time. Yeah. yeah right. say, did you ask that question and then the alarm goes off? <laughs> now I'm concerned. Yeah. <laughs> they don't want us um, talking about this. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but I, I, think, I think it's a really serious question, and it terrifies me. Right? We're, we're brought up as Americans to believe that we've got the freedom to do and say and be you know, whatever, whoever we want. And the idea that one switch could be pulled and that would be it. I mean, I would hope that our country would never get to that point, but. It's an interesting, interesting question. Uh, so I wanted to go back to the Arab Spring for a minute because this is something I was fascinated with. Um, the, there have been two academic papers that have come out. Uh, one, one last week that was supportive of, of Twitter's role in, in uh, an Egyptian revolution. Um, and then one a few weeks back that, that was not supportive, uh, that, that said that there was really no correlation between. Uh, so I think the jury's still out. Um, but I, I do think that it's hard to deny that, that social media makes it easier for just people to organize with other people. And that can't be good for governments, like big, big governments who are repressive. You know, so I, I think, like, you know, you, what do you want to do about North Korea? I want to, like, send a satellite up that sends them, you know, free uh, Wi-Fi, like Starbucks. <laughs> Open a Starbucks there and, and, uh, and, and let people start to communicate. Right. And I think the debate with, you know, whether social media played an important role. Also, you have to look at the mainstream media, and it made them pay attention mm -hmm. and put front-page stories. You know, what was Castro's turning point when he got a front-page story in the New York Times and everyone learned about this, this movement in Cuba? It's kind of a similar idea where they start to, you know, mainstream media is pushed to learn about this. They start covering it, then, then the whole nation, Well, there's the been world, concerns around the famine in Sudan right now. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe it's Sudan. Somalia, Somalia I'm sorry. Um, about, you know, is it getting the attention it deserves? And, and so, you know, independent groups and, you know, aid organizations are going over there full throttle trying to push this out through their own means. You know, the great thing, you know, that bloggers really celebrate about the Internet is it gives you the power to be a citizen journalist. But I would argue that you also have a responsibility as a so-called citizen journalist to be accurate and fair. And so I guess my question, am I allowed to ask a question? Ask, yeah. Ask All right. Me. My question would be, is there ever such a thing as unfiltered information? Can you get unfiltered information in news? 
New York people Times. claim that, <laughs> right. <laughs> that NPR and CNN and MSNBC, you know, lean less. And then people claim that Fox News but, and... But, but see, and that's the other thing is as consumers of media, we can now choose which filter to buy our content from. But what if I don't want a filter? So I guess maybe the best thing is, shouldn't we just trust what we're hearing from people who take the picture on the plane or, you know, send those pictures out of a, an uprising in some country? I mean, the, I, the former uh, executive director of uh, uh, Move On, Eli Prazer, Prazer, is that his name? Yeah. Wrote this really interesting book, um, and I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it. If you know it, I'm trying to think something of something about being inside the bubble. And, and like Facebook now only shows you. Uh, you're friends with people, right? So you only see news from people that you supposedly trust. But what if all of your friends only lean one way or only believe in you know, a couple issues? And so his point was, are we trapping ourselves in this information bubble that we're not getting as much information as we want? And we should teach that in schools. We should teach people how to look at a, a diverse amount of information, how to, how, to, how to use RSS to get right. information from across different opinion makers. I mean, we, we've never, it's never been easier to follow people who you disagree with. Right. You know, how many people do you personally follow? I, I, I follow like six people that I disagree with and out of thousands so it's no, not no, you're <laughs> seven, you're probably, you know. yeah yeah <laughs> I actually blocked you but, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, sir yes uh, can you tell us who you are I'm sorry just so we know unfortunately Howard Dean lost and Obama is really <laughs> the first president to have won with a social media internet campaign um, you've mentioned a little bit with Rahm Emanuel but my question is how would you critique Obama's use of the same media to govern? Has he done anything at all? Is it possible? Is it not possible? I had the experience of having an interview with his campaign as somebody who voted for him last time, and I raised that question. They told me it's not possible. Uh, what do you think about it? I would say I, I think all three of us here know somebody at one time or another that's either worked for the Obama campaign or the administration, and the very nature of government is slow, right? I always I compare it to I like to run camp on campaigns that I am the challenger, I'm not the incumbent, right? Because you're a bureaucracy, and by that very nature of being bureaucratic, there's checks and balances, and things have to move slower. And so just to get an interactive White House website up. I can't even imagine how many lawyers had to sign off and things had to be cleared by the NSA and you know, whatever else. And so I think, I think because of the very nature of what it is, it prevents its growth. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying you can't. It's, I don't think it's fair to compare a campaign and a government because they're two inherently very different things. And I think he has made strides. I think a lot of people um, are quick to say, and it's because you know. He campaigned, you know, what's the saying? You campaign in poetry and, and you, you govern in prose, right? Uh, so, so, I mean, I think he, he campaigned at far extreme, uh, but I think government has made great strides, whether it's, yeah. you know, the, the White House website. What, I like Austin Goolsby at a whiteboard, you know, talking about economic policies and putting those up on YouTube. Those are things that, that really never happened before, and it's, it's a level of transparency and accessibility right. that, that you can interact in, and, and even some of the data they've opened up from a dorky <laughs> side of things, you know, through APIs or open sourcing, you can now manipulate a lot of data and use that to do cool things that you couldn't do before. So I think they've done a lot of things, but it's just not as dramatic as raising $700 million online. Yeah. You know, you got to just wish Richard Nixon had a Twitter account. <laughs> <laughs> think what we would have known. At Tricky Dick. <laughs> yeah, at Tricky <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Julianne's question. Uh, Julianne's question. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, unfiltered information, I think the only way you can get unfiltered information is by going through a number of filters. And the more data points you get, the more likely you're going to have unfiltered information. And that goes also looking at whether it be the, looking at a couple of evening news and looking at uh, Twitter feeds and following bloggers or whatever. But the more you read, the more you look at filtered information, you find an unfiltered viewpoint. I absolutely agree. Um, just so everybody knows, you can follow us at number sign. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pete Hoekstra. N-H-I-O-P-S-M. Uh, we're streaming live thanks to the help uh, here from the Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College, uh, courtesy of our friends at the Live for Your Die Alliance here in New Hampshire. Uh, I think we're going to take another, uh, let's take one more question here, and then we're going to take one uh, from the, tw the Twitter feed. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, can you identify any New Hampshire candidates, either local or state, 
that have either enhanced or won their election due to the use of media? So, um, God, I'm trying to think of her name now. She ran for Congress. Annie McLean Custer. Annie McLean Custer. I, I can't. Is my guy, and we won. No, 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 no. <laughs> but I hear there's a rematch. Yes, we're getting. I hear there's a rematch. rematch. All right, so we'll, we'll talk about this All one right. later. But I, I don't know if she's necessarily benefited from the use of social media. I will tell you that because she had a very powerful online lobby. And by lobby, I should actually you say online interest group, uh, the P Triple C or the Progressive Campaign Change Committee. Did I get that right? Uh, picked Annie as one of her, their favorites in terms of they sent out lots of emails to everyone across the country. So whether you were in New Hampshire or Alaska, you found out about Annie McLean Custer and all this great work that she wanted to do to help you know, New Hampshire in Congress. And so they raised a tremendous amount of money, which made it, it was a top, it was a tier one race uh, for the DCCC, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. Too many acronyms. And uh, I don't I don't think, I, I didn't follow it incredibly closely, but I don't think if, if that national group hadn't paid attention, I don't think it would have been the race that it was. And you worked on it, so you could probably speak better to no, it. No, I was six feet tall and had a whole head of hair when it started. So, <laughs> uh, I think that's a really good question about New Hampshire. I have seen people in campaigns in this state learn from the presidentials when they come in. We get this circus that comes through every few years, kind of teaches us. Um, there are a number of state senators, a number of legislators in the state who do a very good job communicating with their constituents on a broader scale through Twitter and, and using Facebook. So it, it's being adopted more and more. The only question I always have is when someone says, and that's a good example, Annie Custer ran a very strong campaign, and I was on the other side, so I had a chance to see that. And frankly, I don't care what you use for a, for a methodology or a tactic. Usually good campaigns win, bad mm -hmm. campaigns don't, usually. And I think social media is almost always a part of the thing. But great commercials or great mail or great get out the vote does not always turn into a victory. There's a lot of other variables in that recipe. In her case, I agree that she did a, she did a really good job and had a very strong lobby of followers and people that helped her to sort of get her message out. There's no question. Okay, um, Go ahead, can we Anna. take one from uh, over the, the uh, Twitter feed? Mm -hmm. So for the last question, uh, at Ann Weber 2 are there some issues that do not translate well through social media, such as some economic issues, example TARP bailout? Anything, that, anything that's really, really hard to talk about in, in more than 140 characters uh, becomes difficult to talk about <laughs> in social media. You can explain that. I, no, I mean, I mean you, can, you can make fun of TARP in 140 <laughs> characters, right? But, but you can't explain why it worked in 140 characters. That, that takes, a, a, it takes a, I'm reading, I'm reading a, a, a huge book right now, which is barely explaining it to me. So I think that the, the complexity of an issue uh, makes it harder to talk about over, over social. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think it's important that we're, you know, that we look at this discussion in terms of, you know, digital as a whole and social media as being a part of that. Because your social media strategy, you might not be able to explain TARP at 140 characters, but you can put up a YouTube video of your economic director explaining it, or you can, you know, write 20 blog posts on it. You can do a lot of things that contribute to the conversation right. and then complement those with social media and push people to the blog posts. Um, you know, and start engaging with them on those blog posts and take that to social media where they're more comfortable. So digital, I think, I think pretty much every, every issue is, is, can be well suited for digital, but then social media isn't always the best fit, but you can complement it. I, I would agree. I think that some of the most, to me, memorable uh, moments in campaigns are the ones that are done creatively. For instance, how many here understand the methodology behind UPS delivering shipments? I don't. Right. Okay, well, there's a very smart person in the back of the room, and that's why he's running the computer. Um, but I don't. So, so do you guys remember the brown? We are brown, or okay? So the whole guy with the long hair standing at a whiteboard with these little images, you know, kind of moving throughout. I thought that was really clever, and all of a sudden, I felt like I understood more about UPS even though it was a subject I didn't care about. So to me, the first word that I thought of when I heard that question was creativity. And, and that's a big role of the new media director is to be creative. Uh, working on issues of workers' rights and collective bargaining. Does anyone find that incredibly fascinating? 
OK, a couple people. I'm in a very academic institution. Most people don't. Um, and so how do you try to explain to the average person, especially younger voters, right? A lot of younger voters don't understand issues like that. And it's all about creativity. Yeah, a great example, too, would just be an infographic. And, and so, was, yeah. so, you know, an image, you want to talk about them? No, I was just thinking, <laughs> of, I was just thinking OK Cupid infographic. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So, uh, says the group of 30 year olds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, it's just a way to distill a very complex thing into a graphic that anyone can understand. And that is perfect for social media because it's going to be shared and commented on and things like that. So, so there are ways to be creative and distill a very confusing, cumbersome topic into something that anyone can digest and understand. So let me ask this. Kevin, who's usually always right, was just slightly wrong because there's one last question. <laughs> and I get it. Are we a better republic, a better democracy because of the digital space today? Um, I almost said, are we better off today than we were four years ago? I don't know where that came from. <laughs> are, we, are we a better republic? Are we better voters? Are we better informed? And are there better campaigns because of the digital space? No. Yes. If you ask my mother, no. Right? She says we share too much. There's too much out there. So you're saying generationally? I think it's a huge generational issue. My mother claims, no, my mother's a smart woman, but I don't know if she has particularly, you know, a particular insight in this. She claims that my brain is, is wired differently than hers. That's true. She also blames the fact, oh, blames, she credits my career due to the fact that at the age of three, so in 1983, she put me in a Muppets keyboarding class. <laughs> and that that is the reason I have the career I do have today. I don't know that that's necessarily true, but I don't necessarily know that that's not true. So I think we, the kind of the Gen Y and the, or Gen, Gen X, what are we, Gen Y? I'm a millennial. I don't know what you are. Oh, well. I'm undefinable. <laughs> okay, well, I'll say like 35 and under. So the MTV generation, if you will, that we process information differently, for better and for worse. But we have to. And I, I saw a statistic not, not too long ago that said the, the, 20 years ago when you had a job, you switched what you were doing every 23 minutes. And now it's every 40-something seconds right. you switch what you're doing. So, so our brains have changed because the jobs have evolved to require a sort of multitasking ability, which wasn't even possible 20. When you watch Mad Men, you see Don Draper sitting there. What is he doing all the eight hours a day? Besides <laughs> drinking. Smoking, yeah. and drinking. Smoking, Smoking and drinking. Smoking and drinking. What is he actually doing? He's getting working on one thing for six hours. Yeah. You know, I couldn't, if I did that, I would be fired in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so to, to answer the question, from, from my point of view, is it is better because it's encouraging more participation. I don't know if it's always the participation that, that people enjoy and like and it can get nasty at times, but there is more participation and that's the point of a democracy. To have participation, to have spirited discussion, then to you know have results affected by that. Well this has been a proof Yes sir. The proof is in the um, I think if you look over the broad picture of what's happening in the country uh, with uh, illiteracy at the record lows and people just picking up little bits and pieces that are fed to them. We're not really uh, a literate nation in the sense of being able to tweet and transfer that into more in-depth, accurate knowledge for good voting purposes. Yeah. We have failed thus far. I, w I would say that we're the most knowledgeable generation ever to exist. I mean, and just just on the on the, on the we know more because there's more to know. Uh, but but you know, America before elected you know James Buchanan president. You know, America has made really bad decisions prior to the invention of social media. So I think that the, 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 you know the medium is agnostic, and it's what we make of it. And, and we're we're all trying to make of it something that makes it a better re republic. Let's do this. You two can take that outside. <laughs> <laughs> Like you've got additional feelings here. One quick thing before we say goodnight. Um, the Institute of Politics at St. Anselm is about challenging conventional thought. No matter what your party, no matter what your policy or ideology, no matter what you're thinking. One of the things we try and do is encourage dis discussion and encourage people to find out for themselves and to question. I would offer you a homework assignment, even though I'm not your professor or teacher. <laughs> but try this. Go home tonight to your dorm, or wherever you're going tonight, Log on to one of the campaigns. Answer a tweet. Post a question. Find out how long it takes Barack Obama or Mitt Romney or Michelle Bachman 
or any of the candidates, you pick one, but not the one you follow. See how quickly they get back to you. Someone gets back to you. Let's find out whether or not this big idea really makes you feel more connected. Because I think one of the things we talked about was humanness, connectivity, and at the end of tonight also, um, I believe, Jenny, you, you do have your mother's apple pie recipe, which you'll be sharing. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for being a great audience tonight. This has been a fascinating discussion. We've gone two more hours. We can't do that, unfortunately. I want to thank the Live Free or Die <clears throat> Coalition for streaming us tonight. We have lots and lots of questions we didn't get to over the Twitter feed, but these folks will be here. I really want to thank Clay. Great job. Julie Lynn, thank you. And, you know, I, Ryan, when you guys finish outside, <laughs> we can always take some more questions from the crowd. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. And to echo that, um, I, on behalf of the St. Anselm College and the Institute of Politics, I'd like to present these nice tote bags with the New Hampshire 2012 presidential primary logo on it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. That was really fun. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Yeah, it was a blast. Yeah. <laughs>